The word yoga, as most of you doubtless know, is the same as our word yoke, Y-O-K-E, and the Latin word jungere, to join. Join, junction, yoke, union, all these words are basically from the same root. And so likewise, when Jesus said, my yoke is easy, he was saying, really, my yoga is easy. And the word, therefore, basically denotes the state that would be the opposite of what our psychologists call alienation, or what uh, Buddhists call Sakaya Drishti, the view of separateness, the feeling of separateness, the feeling of being cut off from being. And most civilized people do in fact feel that way because they have a kind of myopic attention focused on their own boundaries and what is inside those boundaries and they identify themselves with the inside and don't realize that you cannot have an inside without an outside. That would seem, wouldn't it, to be extremely elementary logic, that we could have no sense of being ourselves, of having a personal identity, without the contrast of something that is not ourselves, that is to say, other. But the fact that we don't realize that self and other go together is the root of an enormous and terrifying anxiety. Because what will happen when the inside disappears? What will happen when the so-called I comes to an end, as it seems to? Of course, if it didn't, I mean, if things did not keep moving and changing, appearing and dissolving, the universe would be a colossal bore. And therefore, you are only aware that things are all right for the moment. I mean, I hope most of the people in this gathering have a sort of genial sense inside them that for the time being, things are going on more or less okay. Some of you may be very miserable. And then your problem may be just a little different, but it's essentially the same one. But you must realize that that sense of life being fairly all right is inconceivable and unfeelable unless there is way, way, way in the back of your mind the glimmer of a possibility that something absolutely unspeakably awful might happen. <laughs> Doesn't have to happen. Of course, you'll die one day. But there always has to be the vague apprehension, the hintergedanke, that the awful awfuls are possible. It gives spice to life. Now, these observations are in line with what I'm going to talk about tonight, the intellectual approach to yoga. There are basically certain principal forms of yoga. Most people are familiar with Hatha Yoga, which is a psychophysical exercise system, and that's the one you see demonstrated most on television because it has visual uh, value. Karma Yoga is the way of action, of uh, using one's everyday life, one's trade, or an athletic discipline like sailing or surf riding, or track running, as your way of yoga, as your way of discovering who you are. Then there's Raja Yoga, that's the Royal Yoga, and that's sometimes also called Kundalini Yoga. And that involves very complicated psychic exercises having to do with awakening the serpent power that is supposed to lie at the base of one's spiritual spine and raising it up through certain chakras or centers until it enters into the brain. There's a very profound symbolism involved in that, but I'm not going into that. And then finally, there, is, uh, well, there are several others. There's mantra yoga 
mantra yoga, which is the practice through chanting of humming either out loud or silently certain sounds which become supports the formulation or what is in Sanskrit called jhana. And jhana is the state in which one is clearly awake and aware of the world as it is, as distinct from the world as it is described. In other words, in the state of jhana, you stop thinking. That is to say, you stop talking to yourself and figuring to yourself and symbolizing to yourself what is going on. You simply are aware of what is. And nobody can say what it is because, as Korzybski well said, the real world is unspeakable. A lovely double take in that. But that's jhana. That's zazen. Uh, where one practices to sit absolutely wide awake with eyes open but not thinking. That's a very curious state, incidentally. I knew a professor of mathematics at Northwestern University who one day said, you know, it's amazing how many things there are that aren't so. <laughs> you know, I mean, he was talking about old wives' tales and uh, scientific superstitions and so on. But when you practice jhana, you're amazed how many things there are that aren't so. Because when you stop talking to yourself and you are simply aware of what is, that is to say, of what you feel, what you sense, and even that saying too much, you suddenly find that the past and the future have completely disappeared. So also have disappeared the so-called differentiation between the knower and the known, the subject and the object, the feeler and the feeling, the thinker and the thought. They just aren't there, because uh, you have to talk to yourself to maintain those things. They're purely conceptual. They're ideas. They're phantoms, ghosts. So when you allow thinking to stop, all that goes away. And you find you're in an eternal here and now.